Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our conversation here at Center Stage. Government and entrepreneurs, a marriage made in hell. Joining the conversation, Daniel Sachs, co-founder and co-CEO of AppDirect. That's a unicorn company, so one with a billion dollar valuation. And also with us, Jose Manuel Barroso, president of the European Commission from 2004 to 2014. Well, let's pick up on the topic, government and entrepreneurs, a marriage made in hell. Daniel, are these uncomfortable bedfellows? <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's intimidating sitting next to a prime minister, you know, on stage in front of many people. But I think that, you know, for the entrepreneurs in the room, I think that there is a lot of hope in, in the way that governments are driving outreach um, and really encouraging um, innovation and ways to work together. Um, so I think particularly when we think about a marriage made in hell, I think there are cultural differences that make it challenging, but we can all learn from each other and align on culture. And I think there are programs, um, many that you'll speak to, uh, that make it easier for entrepreneurs and people starting companies to understand how to crack government, how to innovate. And I think that one you know, huge opportunity for people to look at is just the obvious low-hanging fruit in your day-to-day -day lives and really kind of thinking more about how you as an entrepreneur can uh, really work with governments uh, to disrupt kind of key elements of your day-to-day -day life, whether that's the way you vote, whether that's the way you pay taxes, um, really encouraging dialogue and discourse around that. Jose, many in this room might still be skeptical and saying the best thing governments can do is basically step out of the way. It's a sort of relationship even a Tinder app wouldn't approve of. <laughs> Come into the conversation. Uh, uh, yes and no. In fact, the governments, uh, sometimes they do too much where they should not do, and sometimes they don't, know, they don't do what is necessary to happen. To give an example based on my experience in the European Commission, in Europe, we don't have an internal digital market. In Europe, we have 28 mini markets. That's different from the United States of America. When you are in San Francisco, you go to Arizona or to Nevada or to New York, there are no barriers. In Europe, roaming, for instance, still exists. In fact, it was during my commission that we tried to put an end to roaming expenditures. If you go to, from, from Portugal to Spain, you pay roaming. If you go from Luxembourg to Belgium to the Netherlands, roaming. We are going now to put an end to it because, in fact, the big incumbents were, and sometimes still are, very close to the governments. And there are a lot of resistance at government level in Europe to have a real, true digital market. So, and that's, of course, a problem for startups because the big companies, the big American companies, they can deal with 28 difficult different markets. They can invest in the legal expenditure, all the compliance costs, and so on. But the small startup is much more difficult for the, small, for the, the startup to grow. So in fact, governments there should try to support the plans that the European Commission has put forward to have a fully integrated digital market. At the same time, the government school do more in terms of creating best ecological conditions for innovation to prosper. Subsidies for broadband, for instance, I think it's indispensable. But also, the government should look now at the ways in which all this revolution that is taking place in the digital world is going to impact all sectors of our life, from health conditions to the new conditions of work. Everything is going to be very much impacted. And for that, we need also new policies to increase the flexibility and the mobility in our societies. Let's pick up on some of those points. Daniel, you have operations in Germany, Canada, and India outside of the United States. Is it difficult to sell into a fragmented European market? It's definitely a challenge, and I think we spend a lot of time really understanding the local markets. And you'll hear a lot of perspectives saying, in order to sell into Portugal or Germany or Spain, you need to have a local presence. And I think as an entrepreneur, you need to have a lot of confidence to say, OK, I may be one person in an apartment, but I have the confidence to be able to go into a new market, understand the laws, and address the concerns. So when we started, we were probably about 10 people when we first broke into Germany. Um, and we worked initially with Deutsche Telekom, which was a large enterprise at the time. And we got them launched and enabled to launch a cloud service that previously 
uh, they weren't able to do and get to market with. Um, so I think that if you can really look at opportunities um, to work with big enterprises, even when you're a nascent company, um, it's a great way to get, get going. And I think as you scale, um, really understanding the evolution of how you can make the biggest impact in local markets and really looking for those little areas of opportunity that you know that governments or private public partnerships wouldn't be able to get into if it weren't for uh, those little windows of startups helping out. Uh, Jose, I think you know the question is coming, so let's get this one out of the room because as we talk about having a conversation about building stronger connections between government and business, 150,000 people signed a petition objecting to the bridge that you crossed from the top job in Brussels to working for Goldman Sachs about 18 months later. Have you been judged too harshly in the court of public opinion? <laughs> oh, there are different opinions. Uh, as you know, the European Commission ad hoc committee just now clarified that I respect all the ethic rules. But in fact, the very fact that the issue was raised shows a negative attitude of many people towards international finance, and in this case, uh, a United States uh, institution. And it shows that there are still a lot of um, cultural negative attitudes in Europe towards, I mean, the, the new world, the financial world, the, the global integrated world we are living in. Um, and I think it's a, a mistake. I think we need, for instance, in, in this world of digital transformation, we need a more innovative finance contribution. Um, many of those startups that were such a big success in the United States, they could prosper because they had venture capital. The United States, they had uh, invested more, at least 20 times more than us in Europe. Only now in Europe, we are, in fact, building some capacity. And in fact, the, it's very promising now, uh, the, the building of financial capacity to support startups, um, to support uh, innovation-friendly environment. But in fact, still today, there exists in Europe not only in Europe, by the way, when we see the debate in the United States, we also see a lot of nationalism and protectionism. But in Europe, in some quarters, there is a negative attitude towards the United States of America, everything that comes from the United States of America. And, and I think it's a mistake because we have some differences between Europe and the United States of America, but basically we need to have a joint marketplace between Europe and the United States. The opportunities for growth and for employment there are huge. And if now the European leaders or the European uh, NGOs continue to have this negative attitude towards open societies, open economies, and putting things together between us and America and other, for instance, Canada, just recently we saw the idea of having a veto on a trade agreement with Canada with arguments that were really irrational, saying that Canada does not respect some basic standards. Or, or Canada is a country that is extremely developed, and basically they have the same standards we have in Europe. So why should we oppose uh, a trade agreement uh, with Canada? That is part of the debate in Europe, but I believe at the end, since this movement is driven by technology and science and not by governments, I believe we are going to succeed. To be fair, the protectionist policy story has been fueled on both sides of the pond. And in case you missed it, it is the US election day in the States today. Daniel, what do you make of some of the protectionist policies of Trump? And do you fear the impact on technology and the ability to sell across borders and to converge and disrupt industries if protectionist policies come to the fore in the United States? Definitely. I mean, I still think it's early to tell what the outcome and impact of the election will be. But I think from a perspective of really looking at it from an entrepreneur's point of view, uh, we really see a global world. And you look at communities that are connected like Facebook, right, which go beyond government lines. And I think similarly, you know, in Silicon Valley or as a startup, wherever you are, um, I think you want to look at the world from a global perspective and say, how do we work you know, across different countries? So AppDirect, for example, now works in over 100 countries, um, and we have a local presence in uh, dozens of countries. Uh, but really, the, the challenge is, how do you understand the local dynamics? So even to what you highlighted in terms of you know, Europe being a market of 28 different countries with different laws, that creates a lot of opportunities um, to think about the way people interact as well. 
So you take a market like uh, you know Estonia, and there's a lot of innovation there, and it's easy for us to work with them because they're so open to working with uh, tech companies. But then you contrast that to, let's say, Germany, which is very open to working with American companies. However, because of data re residency and privacy laws, puts up quite a bit of barriers. So. You wanted to come in on this? No, it's exactly I always say, and it's very important that uh, yeah, we are someone who really works in the sector. I'm, I'm not a technology guy. I just can share with you my experience from a policy making a political point of view. And this is the problem. 28 different regulations in Europe make it difficult for, let's say, a, a, a startup to immediately acquire the dimension, the size to operate all over Europe. This kind of difficulty does not exist in the United States. In the United States also, in terms of venture capital, they are much more developed than we are here. Now, in fact, Europe is do doing much better. Last year, 2015, is the record, absolute record, in terms of financial investment in the digital uh, technologies, uh, media and techno technology, and uh, in general, digital technologies. In fact, the pipeline for financing is huge today in Europe, while in the United States, apparently, yet it, ha it has reached the peak one or two years before. So, and in Europe, we have a lot of talent. And this is important to say. So from London to Berlin to Stockholm and now Lisbon. Lisbon is my hometown. You see with this web summit how uh, ambitious Lisbon and, Euro and Portugal is now in this area as well. And many other countries, we are now seeing clusters of innovation that simply did not exist 20 yes. years ago. That w did not exist at all. In the United States, it existed already, not now, in, not, not yet in is Europe. And now we are seeing that, and I believe the growth is going to be exponential. Is there a headwind, though, because the European Competition Commissioner believes that the tech titans might be impacting innovation here in Europe? You've got big fights on tax charges against the likes of Apple and Google. Do you think that is the right approach? Level the playing field so some of the innovators in Europe can actually get a start? No, I, I'm in favor of a strong competition rules and strong competition enforcement. I believe the European Commission is not biased in the decisions it has taken recently. The reality is that we have to have some proper level of regulation. The important thing is to have a level playing field. The important thing is for a company, namely if it's a startup, not to find completely different rules, let's say from Portugal and Spain or even the United States when they come here having to deal with 28 different rules. So, but the competition enforcement and strong competition rules, this is important because if the big players take it all, there is no room for the new, the new players, namely startups. We saw that in Europe with the telecommunications. I can tell you now, based on my experience, the big resistance to innovation came in many cases from the big technology uh, telecommunications incumbents that they were usually before connected to the governments and they did resist to any kind of opening the market to right. new players. Those tech titans are right on your doorstep in the States. The likes of Apple, Google, Facebook, are they inhibiting your growth story or the companies that w you work with? I think, I think many of them cultivate a really uh, great ecosystem and encourage partnerships. And we're seeing that flow into European companies as well. So a lot of the telecoms or financial service companies are starting to outreach and create ecosystems around what they do, which really helps level the playing field. I think from a government perspective, though, one of the things that governments could do to help level the playing field is really reduce the regulatory and procurement burdens of a startup working in. So if we think about like starting a business, we're iterating around uh, you know, a few months cycles to get venture funding, right? Maybe a year to go from seed to A, but if it takes two years to apply to get uh, approval to have a government contract, then that really inhibits uh, barriers for smaller companies to start. So, so. Re reduce the regulation, but what about active participation with subsidies or other types of initiatives? I mean, right here in Portugal, there's been a 200 million euro initiative for the government to invest alongside venture capital and startups. Do those types of initiatives work for companies like yours? I think subsidies maybe are out there and available and, and a helpful uh, kind of token, but I think that for startups, we really want to innovate, we want to push the boundaries, and I think in order to do that, governments, governments need to be able to take risk. And I think culturally, there's a big difference between Silicon Valley and elsewhere in terms of in embracing failure and experimentation. 
So I think that if you can take examples where you can break off certain components um, and open them up. So for example, disaster recovery in the United States via FEMA is now partnering with uh, startups like Twilio and TaskRabbit um, when there's an emergency response. Um, things like that, taking components and open sourcing them out to startups to be able to build uh, commerce around it or build problems, solve problems around it, I think is a great start. Jose. I think quite one area, if I may, where I believe subsidies make sense is, for instance, in a, a broadband infrastructure. And uh, in Europe, we have seen that, in, in Portugal as well. So today, we have a good broadband system because there, were, there was government support, so to have access to all the territory. Uh, so there are areas where subsidies make sense, but I believe subsidies, for instance, in terms of choosing the winners, it's a mistake. So we have to be extremely careful when we have a program of the government to uh, support some star startups. Because in fact, it's not the government that is able to choose at an earlier stage those who are going to be successful. It's the market, it's the innovation community, and that's why venture capital, so it's private venture capital, usually it's more effective than a public financing. Having said that, of course, I think we should welcome the initiatives taken by the Portuguese government and others because they are showing their commitment to this uh, evolution in this sector. We almost have to wrap up, but I want to get a quick comment on Brexit because many people in the room feel like the uncertainty around the Brexit vote is impacting their planning and their decisions. Come in on this because many feel this was a populist vote against Brussels. Do you think Brexit will hamper the ability of many technology companies now who are starting up and are trying to expand in London and across the UK? Now, London has already a very developed, let's say, ecological uh, system for this industry. In fact, some of the best companies in Europe today are in London. In artificial intelligence, probably the number one in the world today is a London-based company. So, I mean, I believe London will always be a very important center. Having said that, of course, it's a further complication. Uh, I, I was very disappointed because I think all of us want more open societies and open economies. To have Britain going out of the European Union is certainly bad news because uh, I believe for freedom of movement, it's better that we all share this internal market with more than 500 million people. And so, and the, the most progressive people in Britain and in London, they were extremely right. disappointed, as you know, with the result of the Brexit referendum. Daniel, how are you planning around Brexit? Uh, I think for us, our business in UK is thriving, and you know, hopefully, we move toward open borders, and uh, we continue to see success in Europe and abroad. Gentlemen, we must wrap up this conversation. Thank you to our audience, and please put your hands together for Daniel Sachs and Jose Manuel Barroso. Thank you.